Just before we get started, I would like to put together a few thoughts from this morning, thinking through historical perspectives, uh, what we might uh, what we we might learn from some of these experiences, and I'll give you just three examples. Uh, one has to do with the Luddites, the early 19th century workers who smashed the machines, smashed the new technologies in factories, thinking that it was the machines that were prob the problem rather than the new uh, industrial age and the huge power imbalance between the industrialists and the workers. So I think this is a theme we'll want to keep in mind this afternoon. Uh, a second is in the other direction. January 1st, 1994, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, went uh, into uh, Vigence, and here we had a situation where radical social justice and solidarity across the world was unleashed for the first time through the use of what was then called the World Wide Web with the Zapatista leaders calling out to comrades across the world through this new medium. And no one really had thought before about the extent to which uh, this new digi digital technology could serve as a rallying cry for social and political justice. And then the, the third example, and here I want to use the term digits as thinking about digital. So uh, we've heard about digital in an artificial intelligence fashion as well as thinking about digits as numbers. But we might also think about digits as fingers. And so if we look at the digital age, here we see another huge set of inequities in terms of who is producing uh, and with which hands the food we eat, the clothes we wear, and the extent to which the so-called digital d divide or even debates around technical reductionism as per critiques around philanthrocapitalism really don't begin to grasp the enormous inequities and social injustices uh, from that regard. And so with that as an introduction, uh, let me turn things over to Marine Aldada from CNRS-CEMS in Paris. So we're no longer PowerPointless in our presentations. <laughs> so I'm going to try to take advantage of uh, these technologies. Um, but uh, I would really like to go back to something uh, that we didn't talk about much today. Uh, but it's just the beginning of this workshop. I want to talk about people um, that are involved in all these digital artifacts. And um, I want to start uh, this presentation with the story, uh, the story of Samia. She is seven months pregnant, and she works in the fields close to her village. Her mobile phone rings. She picks up and listens to Dr. Anita, who encouraged her to go to the <coughs> hospital for her last antenatal visit. Samia never gave birth at the hospital, but encouraged by the community health worker of her village, she is paying to receive this message. Dr. Anita is a voice recorded on a platform hosted in the United States. She is the central character of the MoTeC Global Health Program implemented by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in partnership with the governments of several developing countries. This story is not a fiction. I met many women in India and Ghana who, like Samia, did not have electricity, running water, or toilets in their homes, but had access to a mobile phone and thereby became the targets of new policies using digital technology as a central instrument. This communication is an attempt to make sense of the artifact that ties Bill Gates, Dr. Anita, and Samia. It focuses on assemblages of people first, techniques and institutions that are shaped by dynamics of power in an increasingly digitally mediated world. So as you know, and it's not a discovery for all people that are sitting here, with the widespread use of mobile phone in the global south, digital tools are attracting growing interest from many international aid actors, as well as local governments, 
who are positioning digital technology as an essential driver of economic growth, but also as an obvious solution to many social problems. Initiated by multiple actors from the digital industry, these policies revive old questions about technological development, relations between the market sector and states, and the role of knowledge and technologies in inequalities of all kinds. So today, I'm going to try to focus on uh, three major questions. The first one is who govern these digital policies? We didn't talk much about this today. How do they transform institutions but also individual practices? And how are they received, ignored, or challenged by people like Samia who are supposed to benefit from them? Through this research, I'm questioning the socio-political dimension of mobile application. And as we already stated this morning, I postulate that far from being a neutral techniques, these digital technologies are producing specific effects and organize specific social relations between public health programs, their recipients, and the third party, which becomes unavoidable, digital technology providers. So for this talk, the mobile application used by Samya, Motec, will be our main site of analysis, whether it is used in India or in Ghana. Through the study of this mobile health program, I want to see in which way the medical globalization come into being through digital technology as one tool among this big globalization of health. So I will start just very briefly with MoTeC. What is MoTeC? It's a global platform. It was first tested in uh, Ghana in 2000, between 2010 and 2014 to the form of several apps, but the most famous one was Mobile Midwife. So the Indian uh, part of the program was settled afterwards on the good practices of the Ghanaian experiments. And it was called Kilkari in India, but both uh, Platform are the same. It's the same uh, digital tool, and it's uh, the. On that, uh, let's say that the front side of this app is a weekly voice message messages that are sent to pregnant women and lactating mother until the one year of the child. So it's advices, uh, vocal messages sent in local languages in order to inform women of what should be the good behavior around the pregnancy. So uh, it was. First free, uh, when it was put in place in Ghana, as a pilot it was free, and messages were accessible from any cell phone, and then when it was implemented in India, it was um, a fee-based service, and women had to pay one rupee to listen to each message. And the messages were received on a specific uh, number. So, uh, I want to, to focus on the fact that um, Ghana and uh, India, so the, the first state to implement uh, Kilkari was Bihar, and then it was expanded to uh, other states in North India, and now it's a national program. Just so you know that it's not just like this small mobile app that will disappear after one year. It's a big uh, global platform now, and it's used in more than 20 countries today mm -hmm. to give information around the health uh, behaviors, but also to collect and uh, receive health data because this is the backside of the application. So, I want just to focus on the study because we didn't talk at all about methodology. Antoine talked about it a little bit. This is a qualitative sociological study that we conducted. We met the people that are the implementers and the founders of the program, but we also met the people that were supposed to implement it on the ground. So the community health worker, the, the manager that were supposed to put in place this program, and of course we also met 200 women that were enrolled in the program, 100 in Ghana, 100 in Bihar. So I want to go back to the um, Bill and Samia story. Is it the same story? I want to show you two sides of the story. I will start with the one that I will not develop too much because I wanted to focus on health inequalities, but because Anne Emmanuel is chairing I felt that I had to take about the bill side of the story too, <laughs> and maybe we will talk uh, about it, uh, but I will not develop too much this part. I wrote a paper on this already, but the bill side of the story, I think you know a lot about it already <laughs> because they are very vocal, they are very powerful, they are very present in the global health um, arena. 
uh, an Emmanuel wrote a brilliant paper on financial capitalism, the historical roots of it, so I'm not going to develop this, but as you can see the quotes of the BMGF website and of Bill Gates himself, the whole idea around philanthropic capitalism is the fact that uh, the gift uh, is an investment. And uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates grants are investment. Investment in, uh, in solution, mostly technical solution, whether it be vaccine or digital tools, a technical solution for uh, social problems, but with a commercial future. And that's important because you seize the whole problem from a very capitalistic perspective, and that's exactly the idea of philanthropic capitalism. So I'm not developing this. Uh, I, I think, and we can talk about it, that MOTEC is a very interesting uh, illustration of uh, philanthropic capitalism because it started with very good intention, and at the end of the day, uh, now today, it's a commercial uh, app that is sold uh, to pregnant women, to say it short. I, want to, I, would, I would rather focus on the Samia side of the story because we were supposed to talk about health inequalities. So I will uh, go back to Samia because uh, I want to develop precisely what's happening to Samia in this story. So Samia is supposed to be the empowered Global South mother. She's a generic person, whether it, it be in Ghana or in India or wherever the MOTEC program is implemented in the world, she was an ignorant woman. And thanks to uh, the brilliant digital technologies that empowered her, now she knows what she has to do. To manage her family, to deliver, she knows everything. And she knows especially what is good and what kind of behavior she should have uh, towards health. So, um, of course, I'm questioning uh, this point of view. And, uh, the first reason is that uh, mobile phones, as many technology, is a gender technology. Uh, we didn't talk too much about this, but owning a cell phone is a gender issue. I'm showing this card from the GSMA itself, so the industrial list people are already saying this, and if you are in India, for instance, you have 38% less chance to own a mobile phone if you are a woman than a man. So we start with this, and many scholars in the ICT sector showed that access to digital technologies is uh, difficult for women, and even more for vulnerable women in rural areas, the most vulnerable ones that are supposed to benefit from these technologies. Using cell phone is a gender issue. It's not only owning it. If you want to access the terminal itself, many mobile phones are shared in a family. Of course, it's the male that is most of the time owning the mobile phone and controlling the access to it. I'm not going to develop it too much, but access to credit and uh, financial autonomy that is uh, giving you enough money to pay for mobile <coughs> services is a big issue in many of the developing countries we are talking about. These are some quotes that are showing it. But using MOTEC itself, I want to show how it's creating more and challenging more inequalities. That's, that's going to be my, my focus <laughs> of this slide. So MOTEC is supposed to help uh, women to have better behaviors toward health. And uh, what I'm showing is the fact that it's not because you are sending a weekly message to women that tell them what they have to do that you are changing anything in their behavior, in what they are doing, in what they are, how they are <laughs> handling their life. This woman, for instance, in Ghana, she said, I was told not to give my child water until the six months. I do not follow it. My mother would tell you that when she gave birth to me and I was given water and I'm fine. So the first idea, uh, behavioral approach of uh, development policies, uh, has been criticized by many, many scholars, showing that it's not because you are telling something to someone that his behavior is going to change. So financing with like $80 million of such kind of app is questionable. The second point about prescri prescribing without asking is the fact that it's very useful to put in place devices that are only unidirectional, meaning that you, as a patient, you have nothing to say, you cannot reply, there is no feedback loop, you cannot question the system, you cannot talk about what you are experiencing. It's very useful to have a kind of um, vertical uh, way to, uh, to talk to patients. And uh, finally, a very important point is that normally this kind of app are supposed to help you to connect 
with the healthcare system. And from what we have seen in this study is the fact that these div digital devices are disconnecting people from the healthcare system. You have this quote in Ghana, for instance, it's been helpful receiving the messages from the phone, that way you don't have an encounter with anybody. So when you have difficult relationship with the healthcare uh, system, you have to pay for it. Uh, sometimes you have uh, even uh, violence that is happening in the hospitals. Uh, encountering a healthcare system is already complicated. If, <coughs> if you put in place system where you are supposed to replace the health worker with a mobile device, for instance, sometimes you are bringing people even further away from the healthcare system. But the most important disconnection is the fact that what is told on the mobile phone and on the digital device has no connection with the reality of healthcare infrastructure. And that's the most important point I want to make today. As this woman in BR is saying, whatever is told over the call does not happen in reality. All the facilities are not available. I can't get myself or my child checked up. I think that's the core problem of the digital tools, is the fact that what they are talking about, like health infrastructures, healthcare system, um, doctors, even nurses, or access to free medicines or free healthcare, doesn't exist in the reality. So what's the <coughs> point of telling these women uh, that they have to go to the healthcare facilities in order to be treated for free if it's not happening at all in reality? I will finish with my last slide on the fact that MLF, uh, this application is one example of a myriad of programs that are financed today and that are supposed to be a new magic bullet for the global health system. <coughs> but there has been no proven positive outcomes on maternal health of these devices. They have been put in place now for almost a decade with no uh, scientific proof of their positive impact on uh, the health system. In India, uh, the program was nationally extended, even if there was no positive impact on the pro of the program. It has been expanded in many other uh, countries in Africa, and it's because, in fact, there are multiple business models uh, behind <coughs> this MoTeC application. In fact, health, out health outcomes is not at all the major issue. What you want to develop is a robust app that is able to manage data, whether it be health data, financial data, and also financial flows, because when you ask people to pay for this app, what you put in place is a system of retribution where you collect money from people, and then you can put in place many incentive programs around it. So what you want to build is this robust platform, this robust technological platform, whether it talks about education, health, agriculture, or anything else, uh, it doesn't matter. And the new trend today, I'm working on this now, is really this connectivity between mobile health and mobile money, because that's where core business is. The idea is to develop new financial circuits for health. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marine, for this provocative analysis. I know there are lots of questions. We'll hold them to the end, as with the other presentations. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce Rajiv Mishra from JNU for a talk on the appropriated body, biometrics regime, the digital state, and healthcare in contemporary India. Thank you, Manuela, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, the challenge to keep all of you uh, occupied with the presentation post-lunch nap. <laughs> so yes, the title of my uh, presentation is The Appropriated Body, Biometrics Regime, Digital State and Healthcare in Contemporary India. This is uh, influenced from my thesis work, my network of research which I do, and my personal interest. So the schema of presentation. Uh, first, I'll talk about the focus of what <coughs> I'm trying to study and understand. Second, how I'm doing this on the methodological front. Third, about the field and the narratives I use. Fourth, uh, what I'm trying to deconstruct or deconstructing the structures I call. And fifth, why I'm doing this and the conceptual framework I'm trying to build. Okay, so the focus, what I'm trying to study or understand is I call the appropriated body, where the site of 
control? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a classic Foucauldian thing, but I try to extend it to contemporary times. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk about digital services. In the morning, people talked about how digital technology is being sold in terms of efficiency and all those things. But end of the day, the body becomes the site of control. So how it is appropriated, and what I'm trying to say is that in the process of accessing healthcare through biometrics identification, even before the body gets into the healthcare, it is already appropriated by the market. And I'm focusing on a specific population, the below poverty line population. Why I'm trying to do this? Because the structure which controls this appropriation, uh, the new, new colonial structure or the new liberal structure, and uh, the milieu social, which I call uh, alliance or a collective understanding of World Bank, IMF, UN, technology alliances, philanthropy capitalism, and how they influence and operate this biometrics regime which is running in <coughs> India, and in turn the digital state. Okay, so market appropriation. So as I said, so what I'm trying to understand is that the means to ends or the biometrics identification or the technology to access healthcare which is being sold, which is being used, or which is being very pervasive in India. But in this, the means becomes ends in itself. Like the, the very process, it's an end in itself for people who come from these populations, below poverty line population. Why also I am calling it because I have I've used a term called the double geopardy, because these people face historical, social, cultural problems, hierarchy, caste issues, segregation, which gets added with this <coughs> complex negotiation of biometrics identification, notion of proving one's mistrusted self. So how I'm doing this, the methodological approach I'm using, um, so to understand the appropriation of the bodies uh, and the questions which I'm trying to posit, it is, it's based on the methodological approach I'm trying to use and build. So, and why I'm trying to do this, is to study, extrapolate, and understand the global structure of this biometrics regime and its market-based influence and operation of the Indian digital state for healthcare. Now, that is also coming from my methodological individualism because I believe that to understand the whole or this complex structure, uh, the focus on element has to be there. And in that element, users hold a very important key there for understanding. So, and in that, because the users become both as digital subjects and digital <coughs> objects of the control. So I'm using narratives, tales, and voices to deconstruct that structure. So based on unstructured qualitative interviews, mainly coming from users and also other players involved in this. So uh, this has been influenced from past empirical works on UID Aadhaar, individual fieldwork, collaborative fieldwork. Also in the past, uh, me and Marine have done work on smart cards. But for this project, specifically based on UID and healthcare, trying to talk to BPL population, trying to ask them, know the whole process and how they negotiate the process of accessing healthcare through proving themselves using biometrics. <coughs> and uh, the, the idea is that to ex extend the understanding of use of UID vis-a-vis -vis healthcare, because now the government of India has completely brought UID-based healthcare access for this new program, which I'll mention later on. So uh, two states which I have covered in this study, uh, Jharkhand and Delhi. Well, uh, why Jharkhand? Of course, um, Jharkhand, well, uh, I also come from that state, plus the fact that Jharkhand was one of the states chosen for UID pilot study back when Aadhaar was launched. Also, Jharkhand has the highest poverty in India. Compared to the national average, it's much higher. 39%. In that, predominantly the ST and SC population has a high percentage share of poverty. Also, acute rural poverty is very high in Jharkhand. And uh, the occupational structure is still uh, uh, rural based, where people are in farming, cattle rearing, mm -hmm. mining, and all. <coughs> Delhi NCR, why Delhi NCR? Because Delhi is the center. It, it is the center which controls the periphery, if, if, if I say that. Why? Because also it is the hub of all the technology top-down planning approach, but the government is deciding and, and giving things to people. 
Also, interestingly, Delhi also has a sizable chunk of BPL population, <coughs> around 10%. So that's one of the reasons also to choose Delhi. A uh, couple of pictures from the fieldwork. That's the regional office, uh, UID regional office in Delhi. That the other one is in Hindi. It's, it, it was listed in one of the panchayat offices in Jharkhand to uh, educate or make people aware about uh, uh, digital services but it was in some corner room which nobody was reading. Okay, so narratives. So on enrollment, uh, I use a couple of narratives in categories. So in enrollment, uh, one person says that, okay, we got Aadhaar made. When Aadhaar uh, card was started, it's been more than six years we got it made in the village. There was a camp organized. Well, the second one is a very punching quote, and I use it more often because uh, it shows the understanding which people have. So he's a farmer. He said, sir, I'm a farmer. I work hard to survive. If I don't work in the field, my family will not have anything to eat. But the labor which I do these days has no worth and value. If I don't have an Aadhaar card, I have no value. So this is in, a, in general context of UID, Aadhaar, and identification. Now with respect to healthcare, when I was asking about use of Aadhaar for healthcare, one of the respondents said that for availing any government service, we have to have Aadhaar card. When we go to hospital, we need to show our Aadhaar card for availing government scheme for health treatment. Without Aadhaar card, nothing is possible. Uh, one of the women uh, beneficiaries from this population, in a very punching line, said that they have to tell me where my biometrical health information is going. She was so curious, and if, uh, I mean, this is the idea which the government says, that people don't care about privacy, but people do understand about privacy in India also, in their own ways. So the the... Another narrative is from the doctor uh, in a <coughs> district hospital. Uh, it says that there is one scheme where 2.5 lakh coverage is given to BPL families. Some hospitals are registered as per the scheme. If there is a complicated fracture, so the case is for AIMS or VELOR, people have to give BPL proof, the proof of income, and the local address. Then we see the patient. Then we ask the estimation for the place the case has been referred. Aadhaar card is must, comma, compulsory. No need for OPD, but for availing schemes which I mentioned, like to avail 2.5 lakh critical illness cover, for Ranchi district, this can be done here. So, so many things he said, but end of the day, he said that without Aadhaar, they cannot access that scheme. Well, I'll, I'll use the second quote, uh, because of the time reason. So, this was one of a very senior government official in the health department, so, and it's very interesting, and it also has the structure thing which I'm trying to understand. So, we have two models. First, one is the smart card, but it has cost. But the second one is the Aadhaar, and it has got a good penetration. And the former head of Aadhaar MD, Ram Sevak Sarma, was from state Kada. So the other model is not going for smart card, but for Aadhaar-based rollout. We have Ernst and Young as our transaction advisor, and we have to sit down with them and think through it, and it will take two, three months' time. So a multinational company is advising for digital practices in a state like Jharkhand, and itself shows how well they understand things. Okay, so why, why I use the word deconstructing the structures? Because I think uh, the things happening in India is part of a global biometric capitalism, and it has to be studied in locations of large markets. Well, India is one of the largest biometric markets in the world and being sold as a success story. And why uh, and how that deconstruction can be done in spa uh, locations from South Asia, Africa, and many parts of the developing world, which is being, where being sold. Now, the increasing entanglements of digital technologies and healthcare with massive programs based on use of biometric identification. So, as I said, now Government of India has this massive program on health insurance called the PMJ, which is also called the Ayushman Bharat. It is targeted for 500 million people, but as of now, they have enrolled 100 million people. It is both for APL and BPL. Also, for biometrics based health systems, they have come up with this new NDHP, National Digital Health Blueprint, which is everywhere talking about biometrics identification for accessing health services. Then also they have this National Digital Health Mission, which is again part of the NDHP. So why I'm trying to do this is, is the idea of this whole selling of digital technologies, biometrics and all. So what is being approached, claim and plan. And I try to understand that how what's actually happening on the ground. So it's part of this larger structure, ID4D, World Bank. Yeah, thanks. Uh, World Bank, uh, interestingly, uh, the person who was in charge, first in charge of UID in India, 
Nandan Nilakani sits on the governing board of this ID4D. Uh, in dowsing organization, well, uh, a lot has been talked in the morning session, also a while ago. So uh, the milieu social, which I call part of that, can be seen here. Interesting alliances, security identity alliance, MasterCard, Digital Impact Alliance, will big companies like IDMIA, Morpho, Jamalto, uh, Dermalog are there. Uh, there are more. Uh, this ID for Africa, they are doing every year big conferences, big uh, events, because the idea of biometrics is being sold in Africa massively. Uh, okay, in the end, this why I'm doing it, I'm actually trying to build a conceptual framework. It's coming from my thesis work on technological system, like the large technological systems in development, vis-a-vis -vis biometric identification health informatics databases. The reason why I focus on digital state, because I have uh, tried to study the concept of digital state. I have already published uh, on the domain of food entitlements and social media, where <coughs> I juxtapose tales in both these domains. Uh, this comes from experience of working in sociology, STS, and media culture studies. And the things which I'm interested to do in future is to develop methodology, as uh, Marine was also saying, that the importance of methodology is, is, is very crucial, so I also believe in that. So I'm trying to develop methodologies to understand this global structure. And one of the focus in developing this methodology is taking user feedbacks to understand the functioning of the system and how understanding of this from multiple locations can be assimilated to understand this biometric capitalism. And the last is uh, to develop what I call heterodox perspectives coming from the influences of these three disciplines. Thank you. So we've moved from an analytic frame with Samia at the center to a theoretical perspective on biometric capitalism midwifed by Ernst and Young. And now we turn to Nora Kenworthy's presentation on crowdfunding and the technological determinants of health. Thank you. And I just want to thank uh, the organizers for such a fantastic uh, set of panels this morning. Yes, sorry, I'm short. Um, so I hope you'll permit me to actually start with a bit of a tangent and move a bit back in time before I talk about crowdfunding. Um, in 2004, it seemed like the tide might finally be shifting a bit against the tobacco industry in the United States. And at that time, two graduate students at Stanford began a startup that they believed could fundamentally disrupt cigarette smoking in the country. And as some of you are probably aware, the technology that they came up with was Juul. And since 2004, vaping has not really overtaken the tobacco industry, but rather been absorbed by it. And in the process, it has converted an entire generation of people to tobacco dependency. As late as last year, uh, experts were defending Juul by arguing such things as cigarettes were a wolf in sheep's clothing, and now with vaping, we have a sheep in wolf's clothing, and we cannot get the wolf out of our minds. And I bring up this example not to actually point fingers at specific people, but rather to show that when it comes to health technologies, we seem to struggle to parse the wolf from the sheep. Um, and so I want to start by asking a question of how we can learn to recognize and better yet anticipate how technologies will shape health in the future. Uh, in 2004, uh, when Juul was getting started, these were the top global brands worldwide. We have our classic sort of bad actors of global health care, right? And here's last year. <laughs> From a public health perspective, I think the next big Marlboro or McDonald's is not just going to be a company like Juul. It's going to be Facebook and Amazon and Apple and a host of other corporations whose actions are having an equally large impact on population health but are not being regulated as such. And so I want to start my presentation by emphasizing that we should be really fundamentally thinking about technological determinants of health. And it should not surprise us, given recent news, that, that these companies really are um, wolves in sheep's clothing. And often their tech starts out seeming quite innocuous and even beneficial, but has these really far-reaching consequences for health. This is just a selection of news stories from the last week. So to address them, I think we need a different framework for understanding technology as a social, commercial, political determinant of health um, that is directly and indirectly influencing population health around the world. And I think we need to radically expand our recognition of the kinds of technologies that actually kind of count when we think about health technology. 
Um, so I'm going to try and give one example of that uh, for my research today, um, that kind of tiny little slice of this ecosystem that I look at is uh, the use of crowdfunding websites such as those like GoFundMe to address medical and health needs both in the US as well as in other countries. So our work takes a very multidisciplinary approach to understanding the broader impacts of, of this technology. Many of you are probably aware of this phenomenon of medical crowdfunding, but it's worth underscoring its scale. Um, in the past year alone, medical fundraisers netted $650 million on GoFundMe in the US alone. And GoFundMe and related websites truly are a global phenomenon. They exist on nearly every continent, and they really thrive in places where technologies are intersecting with neoliberal governance. And our research shows that while crowdfunding is a common life raft for those who are in medical need, it rarely offers rescue. 90% of fundraisers do not meet their financial goals. Most raise a few thousand dollars while trying to address pr pretty ca catastrophic illnesses and financial losses. More broadly, uh, we argue that crowdfunding platforms are really kind of in the business of creating vast inequities under the guise of a meritocratic marketplace of need. And they do this by amplifying the biases of the crowd and deciding who does and does not get care. And they serve, as many internet platforms do, as places where race and gender discrimination can thrive, even in the midst of seeming generosity. So uh, GoFundMe often reminds us that they did not set out to become the world's most ineffective and profitable uh, social safety net. Um, but it has <laughs> become one of the most important and inequitable tools for health financing that underinsured people have in the US. And GoFundMe has just announced a huge new arm of its business dedicated to becoming the charity platform for nonprofits, such that all charitable donations might one day go through their platform, and thus they could collect data on all charity donors. And given their astronomic uh, growth to date as a company, I think we should take these ambitions seriously and, and start to contemplate what sorts of futures that might bring about. Uh, so for example, Already this week, uh, GoFundMe has responded to the fires in California by directly directing donors to give to a 501c3 fund, GoFundMe.org, that it manages, from which it will distribute donations to qualifying campaigns as it sees fit. I think this gives inordinate power to a for-profit company to decide how charitable relief aid will be managed and distributed. And so I think this is an instructive case for thinking about how platforms both reflect existing social and health inequities and how they're further fueling some of those inequities through decisions that they make in their platform architecture and how they um, set themselves up as corporations. But I also want to underscore that they help us think through what a seemingly benign technology actually feels like to the poor. And so to talk more about that, I want to actually take time to tell you a story. Uh, so last month, I interviewed Lisa, a woman who had set up a GoFundMe campaign for her husband, Jason, who has type 1 diabetes. Jason and Lisa are second generation migrants to the US, and they have troubled family relationships that make it really hard for them to rely on their families for support. And so at 21, they learned to rely on each other. And for the past eight years, every decision that they have made personally, uh, professionally, financially, has been guided by their need to remain on health insurance so that they can afford Jason's insulin. They have cycled in and out of HMOs. They have scoured through the healthcare.gov website looking for the least bad coverage that they can afford. And of course, they have had prolonged periods with no health insurance at all. They live in Texas, a state uh, that did not expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. And so despite their poverty, Jason has never qualified for public health insurance. And without consistent coverage, his diabetes is incredibly difficult to manage. He told me that when he can't afford insulin, he generally turns to a friend who works in the clinic who can sometimes hand him expired samples. So he has never had the supplies to properly use his insulin pump or consistently test his blood sugar levels. Last fall, Jason ended up in the ICU after running out of insulin and he went into a coma. Jason and Lisa were uninsured at the time, and so they started a GoFundMe campaign to cover Jason's ICU bills and to try and kind of give themselves a more sustainable future. They raised a little over $1,500. Lisa said, we had a little bit of buzz at the beginning and some trickle of funds, but then it died off. 
She said it was hard to make Jason's story compete against those of, quote, little blonde-haired girls with rare cancer. She said it was ironic that the news liked to spread stories of people who died due to lack of insulin, but she asked me, what about people who are alive and trying not to die? So Jason and Lisa's story is shaped by a number of technologies, ranging from his insulin pump to the healthcare.gov website to GoFundMe itself. And these technologies have all been t called life-saving in turn and for different reasons. And yet it's remarkable that none of them actually has the ability to protect Jason's life, filling the yawning gaps in our healthcare system. These technologies also fuel inequities by better preserving the lives of those who can afford an insulin pump or rewarding little blonde haired girls with rare cancer. And so it's not just about what technology can or can't do for the poor, but what it does to them and by extension to all of us. So we often talk about technology as disruptive, right? Um, and yet I think we're unwilling to confront how it truly remakes and overtakes and sculpts anew our social worlds. Tech can be destructive to our public systems, much as Uber undermines investment in public transit and puts riders and drivers at risk. Similarly, Go GoFundMe is creating a tyranny of false meritocracy that may be undermining our collective sense of a right to health. While campaigners strive to present themselves as equally worthy, GoFundMe normalizes a competitive marketplace where one's access to health care is equated with deservingness, not rights and entitlements. And what constitutes deservingness in this website, as we found from numerous interviews, really reflects dominant social values shaped by long histories of discrimination, inequity, and neoliberalism. So crowdfunding is this remarkably downstream technology, right? that may really disincentivize investments in public health systems while promoting late stage urgent investments for the acutely ill. And I think these dynamics have really enormous ramifications for universal health coverage and care movements. So our research suggests that like many other forms of technology, crowdfunding exacerbates and amplifies existing social biases. Um, our newest research, which we hope will be out soon, um, documents some of the race and gender disparities that we've been able to measure on crowdfunding platforms. So while women's and men's campaigns have similar outcomes in terms of how much they raise, women bar a remarkably disproportionate burden of digital care labor in setting up and running campaigns for others. Black women and non-binary people are deeply underrepresented on the platform, and campaigns for non-white and non-binary people do far worse than those for cis white people. Notably, each donation, each donation to a black person's campaign will be $22 less than that to a white person's campaign. So once injustices like these are revealed, companies often have few tools or seem to have few tools at their disposal to actually fix their platforms. And it, I think it's ironic that with such disruptive, far-reaching platforms in our midst, the language that we use to talk about repairing them is actually so diminutive. So Ruha Benjamin argues in, it, in her latest book that this language of fixes right, and tweaks doesn't really confront the social systems that produce inequitable technology in the first place. So she even talks about how technological benevolence can repro reproduce social inequities and prop up the sovereignty of technology rather than question its sovereignty in the first place. So for example, a recent editorial in the Wall Street Journal suggested a number of fixes to medical crowdfunding that uh, the writer thought would make it more equitable. These fixes included the quote, crowdfunding equity extension, a browser extension that would alert you to other deserving but less successful campaigns and hopefully would prompt you to donate to them. Suggestions such as these fundamentally misunderstand the ways that biases become embedded in algorithms, platform architectures, and even widgets. Even a perfectly calibrated extension would be a, unable to address one of the most fundamental inequities of crowdfunding, which is who is actually able to crowdfund in the first place. And typically it's those who are more likely to be white, male, cisgender, affluent, and well-educated. So the widget that would redirect crowdfunding resources towards those who need it more is called taxes. Um, <laughs> it's called universal health insurance. Um, <laughs> there really isn't a fix for a platform that undermines the value of these institutions. But this is not to say that justice-oriented approaches to technology are not possible. Tech platforms have provided space for people, particularly those with diabetes, to organize, to share knowledge, to fight against drug cost increases. 
It has enabled people to create sharing economies for trading insulin and code for hacking their insulin pumps to make them more efficient. Transforming tech platforms and orienting them towards justice may at times, however, mean dismantling those systems because these are the sort of the scrappy technological fixes of an economy of misery. So I think we have to dispense with our orientation to tech as social fact and actually begin to question its social fact. Um, and I think we should also begin to inaugurate processes of subjecting technologies to, as Ruha Benjamin argues, equity audits, but also health impact assessments rather than just marketing plans and cost effectiveness analyses. So Timothy Snyder noted in his 20 Lessons on Tyranny that power wants your body softening in your chair and your emotions dissipating on the screen. I think our fight to transform technology cannot emerge from within the bounds of these technologies. Um, but I draw inspiration from movements like the Our Data Bodies Project pictured here, which is a ground up movement within historically marginalized communities to generate knowledge and resistance about how technology is being used to police, punish, and impoverish them. This project is both a platform in the technological sense of bringing together tools and knowledge upon which others can build, but also a pro-poor and anti-racist political platform. And I think there is great potential for existing and new global health justice movements to contribute to and expand upon these efforts. But to do so, we must be willing to wrestle with and regulate a much broader set of technologies in the name of health, and to recognize that digital technology is one of the principal determinants of health in our time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone is buzzing with comments and questions, but first, uh, we're so fortunate to have with us uh, Jasodara Dasgupta from the National Foundation for India, who will help us parse through it all. That's a really tall order, but <laughs> thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just a really... Um, stunned by this fabulous panel. I think it was incredible um, listening to how technology platforms are mediating our relationships with the state, um, with capital, and with our fellow citizens. And I think the three uh, speakers on this panel really kind of brought out three very uh, sort of um, in-depth uh, examinations of uh, these potential relations. And um, I, I was just uh, sort of struck by the final comment that Nora made about how uh, you know, we need to um, have these global social justice movements that can work on the governance of digital technologies. Uh, but I think we have to move a step backward from that. And I'm reminded of what was said this morning about how it's actually the whole intention and the purpose of these digital technologies have to be guided by the priorities of people who are most in need. So I'm not going to uh, sort of encourage us to go into a post facto kind of trying to govern what is already rampant and ungovernable almost at this stage but to try and change the terms of engagement to say that we need to reclaim and we need to shape uh, the way digital uh, technologies are actually working on uh, various issues of development, including uh, health. Um, I feel that this conversation is bringing back something that was mentioned in the morning about the value system. And I think we really have to understand the value system which is framing the purpose for each of these interventions that we heard. And the value system, quite clearly, as was also pointed out in the morning, is one that does not question the power asymmetries and upholds the system of social injustice in which the poor are devalued, their agency is denied, and their capability to make informed decisions and to shape policy is actually being eroded. So I was struck by the examples in the morning which had this completely top-down approach to deciding how technology would help the poor to become better mothers, and I think um, Marheen's uh, presentation really spoke to that as well. 
and it completely denied them agency or was completely devoid of the contextual realities within which the poor are actually trying to make a better life for themselves. And I think we are also hearing from, um, from what Nora said and perhaps Rajiv also alluded to is about this framing of the deserving poor as opposed to the undeserving poor and how technologies are really compelling us into those distinctions where the undeserving poor as in a crowdfunding platform are people who are just going to fall by the wayside because they don't really measure up to our standard estimations of who is a deserving candidate for our generosity. And the same happens with the Aadhaar, because the Aadhaar was meant to really weed out those who were the undeserving, who were somehow trying to cheat the system. And as uh, I think Rajiv has already indicated, it has had devastating consequences, and you have researched in Jharkhand, and Jharkhand is showing the highest number of deaths due to starvation of families which have not been able to access their entitlements under food security law just because the biometrics don't work or, as Antoine said, there was no electricity at the point when they came to collect their uh, quota of rations. So basically we are looking at a system that is privileging uh, the digital state but it's sort of being underpinned by these other digital actors who are endorsing the digital state in kind of parsing the digital subject of its action. So it is really, in a sense, promoting the projects of governmentality in terms of trying to shape the subject, which is ideal for the projects of governance. So I think we really have to turn this on its head and we have to claim the intentions and shape the objectives from the perspective of the people who are affected. And I'll close with just two quick examples which have not been alluded to, but I think deserve more study. And the first is a citizen's movement in the state of Rajasthan in Western India, which has been a long-standing movement calling for accountability, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, the MKSS, which has actually worked and campaigned on the right to information law and a set of many other uh, laws uh, promoting civil liberties. So they have actually worked with the state in order to call for a people's information portal. Uh, it's called the Jan Suchna portal. It has just been inaugurated. It was a people-led initiative. What remains to be seen is whether, and I think this is a subject of future study, whether the people can continue to call out the state and to shape the terms of engagement with the state. Um, the second example is um, another sort of set of attempts by civil society groups across India to find um, uses of digital technologies to promote governance and accountability of the public sector and public services. So civil society movements have called for the use of digital technologies in the livelihood security law, in the food security law, as well as in the, in the policies and programs around right to health. And these have been various sort of accountability efforts in which people can use digital technologies to actually uh, sort of register their grievances and kind of call out the state for its lapses. So in those, some of which are in some of my earlier papers, we find that only when the state is actually ready to listen does this technology function for the poor. But if there is no kind of uh, institutional framework to listen to the kind of feedback that's coming in from the citizens, then these technologies do not work. So I'll close with that, and I think we really need to challenge this framing and to fundamentally redesign the way people can use technologies and a sort of change the social injustice framework within which technologies are being applied. Thank you. Okay, a cri de coeur. So now we uh, open up to debate, discussion. We've already had some inter-panel debate. Unfortunately, I think our representative from the World Bank has left. Uh, he told us this morning that some of these issues kept him up at night. So let's turn that on its head and think about what ought to keep him up at night. Yeah, um, my question is actually for Rajiv. 
because it's, uh, I, I find your concept of the appropriated um, I mean body very interesting because apparently it's a build on of Foucauldian idea of the biopolitics and the biopower. So I'm simply wondering that, uh, because I mean you did not really go into details on that, like what does it add to our current understanding about the biopolitics and the biopower? Because apparently that in Foucault's idea, he was very much talking about how how the state in, in, uh, in, in developing its techniques of governmentality, it was actually extending its power into our private life by taking control of our body. So I simply wonder what that can be envisioned in our digital age. And then my second question for you is concerning this methodological uh, individualism, because it seems that, well, uh, I mean, data, well, especially big data, is actually pulling together all those individual data. So individual doesn't really count in big data. What counts is this, like, the big pool of data. So it seems that, well, I mean, in terms of methodology, it could be some methodological eclectism, or, I mean, it could be some syncretism or so which will be more appropriate. I mean, this is just some of my, 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 my idea. It's, it's um, uh, for your consideration. Go ahead. Yeah. We'll, do, we'll start we out with one question at a time, and then we may pool them. OK. Yeah, um, on the notion of biopolitics, uh, um, coming from Foucault's classic understanding of what he's talking about, biopolitics. But um, I move ahead from that, and why I'm saying that, that in, in Foucault's understanding of discipline and punishment and use of technology, and in, in, in my context where I'm trying to talk about biopolitics, is, is, is also kind of focus of, one of the focus of this conference is to move ahead from some of the normal understandings of technology. For in the case of Aadhaar, there has been a lot of debate on privacy, surveillance, exclusion. But for me, the new normal of Aadhaar through the control of the body makes a lot of difference. So the normalization of this process of control is something which is happening on everyday basis. And that could be also answered in a way that uh, that how the society in everyday sense of use of this or even if I take a BPL population has no choice then to come and become part of this system you know so this bio biopolitics is run by the state and also in an external sense being coerced by the society all as well so if like one of the respondents was saying that if I don't have an Aadhaar card, I cannot use any of the government services. And the reason why he got the Aadhaar card made, because his neighbors told him that if you don't have an Aadhaar card, you cannot access any of the services. So this biopolitics has an angle of state and also the new normal which is being, being externally coerced by the society itself. Something what I had posed a question in the morning session. With regard to methodological individualism and about what you're talking about, syncretism, well, I consider them as, as a bit separate here because using data or big data from individuals and using them to understand uh, issues and concepts related to data and society is one thing. But if we go to the field, you talk to the users, you talk to people who are affected with this data. What is the sense you get from that field-based understanding? So it's more of an ethnographic, methodological individualism I'm talking about. And this is, again, a kind of very top-down thing because this whole idea of big data understanding, this whole idea of big data analytics, and use of new social media methodologies mm -hmm. is there. But for me, unless and until you connect with the field, nuanced, grounded understanding cannot happen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. I wanted to bring uh, the subject of, um, uh, of rent-seeking and turn our discussion more to the political economy side of, of health, uh, because it looks to me that health is becoming the, the, the field where rent-seeking is becoming like exponentially rampant. Uh, it seems to me that technology, artificial intelligence, um, technology should be bringing health costs down, dramatically down. However, we see 
an inflation of costs. And not only that, uh, we try now the, the rent seekers, the medical landlords now, since they run out of customers to extract rents from, now they want to use the governments mm -hmm. to subsidize the inability of the, like let's say the 99% to put it in those terms, of paying their highly inflated health service prices. And I'm not sure that solutions like as universal coverage and putting the government as a big s subsidy to this rent-seeking scheme is the solution. I think it's the, the other way around. Um, so we also need to, to, to also empower people in terms of education because nowadays most standard doctors are going to be replaced with so much information and credible information on the, in on the internet. You can go to WebMD and basically solve all your uh, your, 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 um, your standard medical needs yourself through uh, networks of knowledge or networks of so solidarity. So most of the services that the health, the inflated priced uh, healthcare system offers, we can do them ourselves. And that's, that's, that's uh, another way that technology could empower us individuals. But uh, I didn't see those trends um, uh, mentioned, I mean, I missed the, 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 the morning se sessions, but I think okay. the political economy aspect yeah. of, of, of I, I would like to, to hear some, some okay. commentary on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So why don't we let Nora speak to this first, since, are you there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> since uh, you mentioned uh, universal health insurance, and then any others on the panel who'd like to comment? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not a political economist, um, but I think the, to the extent that we open up markets to capitalistic agents who are looking to profit off of health care, the more you will see companies like these um, sort of taking up open spaces and, and filling them up. Um, to your second point about how technology might empower healthcare care consumers, I mean, to, to point to the example that I used in my presentation, technology isn't going to make insulin for you, right? It's, it's not going to help you buy insulin, and it's not going to help you live longer without insulin. So I think the example that I brought up in my presentation was actually really about how this couple had knowledge. They had access to technology, um, and it wasn't enough. Um, and so I guess that's the point that I'm really trying to get back to here is that, you know, at a certain level, people need a fundamental right to, to access to health care that, that technology is never going to be able to provide. Health, though, right. is a lot of lifestyle as well. I mean, we, if somebody wants to be jumping off of do, doing parkour off of the Empire State Building, we cannot be subsidizing his broken, uh, you know, limbs and, uh, you know, his, his, his broken knees. I mean, lifestyle is an issue in healthcare, and I think that that needs to be addressed as well. Is it like uh, yeah, maybe on the um, cost efficiency or cost uh, and market issues, uh, I think uh, there is one uh, set of analysis that are really lacking and it's very difficult to work on it right now, is uh, this idea of cost efficiency of digital uh, health. Uh, the few studies that uh, have been uh, published on this show that, in fact, they are very, very, very costly technologies, and uh, most of the actual cost of uh, this is hidden most of the time for technologies that are developed in the Global South, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost we have are the grant uh, that is like you know only the visible surface of the iceberg and if you just look at the grants and for instance if you look at the cost for mobile operators so on uh, on Motec uh, technology we, dis we did this study we were looking for cost efficiency of the technology just to give you an example uh, when the pilot was uh, finished, so all, all financed by the Gates Foundation, the Ghanaian state was asked to take over uh, the project. And uh, what the Ministry of Health said when they discarded the, the project was the fact that just to pay uh, the mobile operator just for the data to be able to listen to the messages, it was costing them uh, $8 per woman just to send these messages during the pregnancy. And they were saying that the Ghanaian state is putting $20 a year for the health of a woman in Ghana today. So how can you put $8 just to send her a message once a week during mm -hmm. your pregnancy? So there is a big issue of cost efficiency. These technologies are not cheap. And in fact, it's cheaper 
to pay for nurses, for soap, for uh, digital, for uh, like normal uh, health skills than paying for like this kind of apps. But this has to be proven and people are working on it right now. But there is, and it links to the second question about accountability. It's the fact that the stakeholders of these technologies, most of them are financial capitalists, it's private interest, it's private companies, so there is no transparency around mm -hmm. the cost and how much these technologies are costing. And that's a big issue because how can you be accountable for something that is completely hidden? And then you ask the states to take over it and when they have to pay the fees, they realize that it's very expensive for them. And that's exactly what Ghana did with the Gates project. They say, we are not in the capacity of paying for this. Kelly? Thank you. Um, excellent panel. Um, my question is, goes back to, uh, actually, Nora, your, your comment about sheep and wolves, because <laughs> I really love that, um, <laughs> what you said there. But then I, I started thinking, um, the, the, why are we so, um, you know, why do we find it so hard to distinguish between the two? So I guess traditionally we think of the sheep as maybe public interest, the state, and the wolf as the market. You know, we've just um, heard from Marine about you know the market forces as the sh as the wolves, but then I thought that's not actually you know it's all that simple. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, we heard about AI in China, right? And a, a one-party state controlling could also be the wolf. Um, so I just wanted to ask the panel um, what who they see as the sheep and the wolf themselves, because we try to combine the two um, with public-private partnerships, kind of like a genetically modified animal in a way. You know, sheep and wolf <laughs> together. That doesn't seem to work very well. Um, and, and the idea that the state is a sheep is kind of, I don't like that analogy, yeah. we're sheep. Um, we need claws and we need teeth as well. So I, I just wondering from you, what do you, how do you define them? Whose voices should we be listening to in all of this if we're gonna get this right? So can I actually, my question is Good. very yep. linked yep. to that. Can yep. I just jump in right there? So I think this was a really important panel. Perhaps most, I mean, the individual stories are fascinating, but I think for me what was really helpful was how it points to the limits and paucity of some of our conceptual frameworks of talking about public versus private, you know, state versus corporations, which is the way we were very much discussing the issue in the morning. Because I think what your examples from the ground really show that there are these complex hybrids which involve uh, philanthropies which are private but not always and public-private partnerships and an example like Aadhaar which is very much about the public sector and the state which is shot through with consultants and tech expertise which are from the private sector and so in some ways this digital realm is a good mirror through which to analyze how the new state has changed, mm. but also how these categories need to be reworked. Mm. Um, and if I can just add a comment about Jashodhara's comment, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, I really hope that in the remaining panels and time mm -hmm. we have at this conference, we go in the direction that you have pointed mm -hmm. us in, because while as academics, we all are reasonably good at critique. We are not particularly creative about actually conceptualizing alternatives. And I think that's where you have pointed, you know, and you've given us concrete examples of what some of these forums and alternatives could be. And so I really hope we take you up on that challenge and move in that direction. Mm. Great. Rajiv, do you want to start with the anthropomorphic uh, muddling Explain here? Explain my metaphor, Move please. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, I'd sum up uh, all these points with uh, this uh, public-private thing and uh, the sheep metaphor which uh, you were talking about. So uh, me and Marine have done a previous project on smart cards for u uh, universal health coverage in India. So. One of the focus was to understand the whole notion of public-private partnership there. Mm -hmm. So I would say the public partnership is a sheep there because in the name of 50-50 partnership of public enterprises and private enterprises, it is the private enterprises which is always in the gaining side. So the state, it, and it's rather more interesting because state is the facilitator and in turn being facilitated by the neoliberal structure 
for selling this technology, accepting this technology, for coming up with policies. And then in the name of being partner to that is again on the losing ground. For example, uh, bringing uh, insurance-led uh, health coverage for poor people, they enroll public hospitals, but public hospitals, they were not bothered to improve the health infrastructure because anyhow, uh, the fee in public hospitals in India is almost free. So if they are uh, bringing private hospitals, so anyhow, the public hospitals are on the losing side of it. So it by default gives an advantage to the private sector. So I think this whole idea of public-private partnership is it requires a much layered understanding and some of the points which you have highlighted could be understood in that way. And also, uh, to the previous gentleman's comment on, on the political economy and hold the notion of cost efficiency, just to add to what Marine was saying, uh, the whole idea of selling this technology is basically or heavily premised on the idea of efficiency, mm -hmm. reducing cost. But time and again, you hear Government of India saying it has reduced cost, it has reduced ghost beneficiaries, it has saved millions and millions of rupees for the exchequer in India. But if you open the UIDI website, you'll not find a single study in doing impact assessment. Uh, I think it's just not economic cost we should focus on. We should also focus on the social cost. That what is the social cost involved in when these technologies are rolled out? And can we really ca have an understanding of efficiency, not in terms of only economic principles, but on social principles also? Because for a country like India, with huge diversity, with different sort of topography, culture, language, this homogenized, top-down understanding of technology doesn't work. So yeah. Yeah, if I could jump in quickly. Um, I, think, I think what I was trying to say about cheap and wolves um, was more about how the sort of seeming benevolence of a lot of tech sort of gets um, sort of uncloaked over time. Um, and, and to really, ask us to think actually about the, the muddiness of what is good and what is bad about tech and how oftentimes a single platform, a single uh, digital product can actually have benevolence and harm at the same time. So, you know, one thing that I, I often like to remind people when I talk about crowdfunding is it makes people feel good, you know? It's nice to have friends and family reach out and support you. It's a way of connecting with community in a time when we don't have a lot of other ways to do that. And so I, as, as much as I think that it presents really significant problems on this kind of large societal scale, I also acknowledge that it has a lot of individual benefits for people who use it, especially people who find success with it. Um, so I think my, my point was more about actually not trying to just identify specific institutions or specific products as sheep or wolves, but to really think about them in their complexities and in how difficult it is to kind of pull away these veils and actually figure out what's there. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that gets us anywhere. But I think, I, I, to get back to your point and your question about where the state comes in all of this is, and is really something that I hope we will keep talking about uh, later this afternoon and to tomorrow, because I think that's the real question on the table here, is not just where is the state, but how is the state being remade by tech? And I was so appreciative of your, your term digital state, and to really ask, like, what, it, what is that, and how does it function, and how does it change the way that citizens interact with the state? Yeah, um, I, I just want to come back to the question about the, the sheep and the wolf, and um, I don't quite agree with you, Rajiv. Mm -hmm. um, I think, on the one hand, we have a monolithic assumption about the state. Mm -hmm. And we also have an assumption that a state is quintessentially an amalgamation of public interest. <laughs> because, theoretically, the state is composed of people's representation. Yeah? So, but this is an assumption I want all of us to rethink. First of all, the state today is not the imagined state as we have framed in human rights conversations where it is 
the individual and the state. And the state is responsible for protecting, promoting, fulfilling all rights of the individuals. That state no longer exists. If we consider all our country realities and we consider the blurring of boundaries between the public and the private, you will find that the state, even without our noticing, has been gradually dissolving and morphing into the private domain. And we have to take that into account. So having Ernst and Young advise the mm -hmm. Chief Minister of Jharkhand is not a matter of surprise. Because most of state functions are now run through consultants and international consultancies. So there is a constant flow that is happening between so-called public institutions and the private for-profit space. I also feel that we need to have a little more um, kind of a nuanced understanding of the term when we say state, do we mean the health system? Because the health system is being grievously damaged by this great outflow of resources into private health insurance companies. The public health systems are being eroded, are being completely dis dysfunctional, made dysfunctional, and therefore inappropriate for the poor to access directly. So there is that. When you speak about you know, the, the sheep, I would say it is the public health systems, that aspect of the state. But if you see the state in its sort of larger meaning, I think we have to really question the ways in which we understand it. Thanks. So uh, perhaps a more apt metaphor has to do with uh, emperors and their clothes or lack thereof, <laughs> and we should leave the animals out of it. <laughs> All right, we have uh, two more questions. If, uh, and Desmond, if yours resonates, let us know. Otherwise, we'll take them one by one. OK. Uh, so um, what I wanted to say resonates a lot what you just mentioned uh, right now, and also what the gentleman set as a question. I think that definitely taking into consideration that our states are not protecting us in the way that probably before they've done, and uh, the from the human rights perspective, there is a lot of to do, especially in this country. I will say there are other countries that as well, they still have public health system in Europe, for example, that is working a different way. Uh, but I also agree that thinking in the values, in ethics, that we were talking before in the last panel, we cannot lose the perspective that uh, this is not only about effectiveness, and this is not only about collecting money and monetize the health sector. And um, my question to you, because I think that the work that you are doing is great, because it's basically building evidence that can show to this kind of business that, that is not only about money, it's also about like the impact and results that they are not uh, achieving and they are not doing nothing related to that. So how do you see that it's possible just to um, regulate uh, these kind of practices and how can we just envision the future of the health system uh, from the global perspective? Because think, take, taking into consideration that the health systems work in a different reality in different regions uh, because of the political issues, also we have to understand that there is something that as human rights uh, perspective we cannot lose uh, at all. Uh, I understand that here health is not any more right and it's, it's very sad because people are dying because they cannot afford just to pay it any health insurance, and that is very sad. Uh, but still, in other parts of the world, it works different. So how can we do from the, legal pers from the global perspective in order just to ambition like this health system for the future? Mm -hmm. And I will just point it out that talking about digital is just see, uh, technology as a tool. It is that the focus it shouldn't be only talking about all of these data or resources or technologies. Um, it's also about like how are we gonna deal with the issue that so many people see as health as a need for building business mm -hmm. uh, without taking just into consideration the ethics uh, of that. Thank you. And Marine, do you wanna start? 
Uh, was yours related? Different question. Different question. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm working on different sites. Like the, the when you talk about like global uh, consequences of it, I think all of us we are working on global health mm -hmm. governance. Like taking example of India and Ghana, for instance, show that this is a global trend, and uh, the whole discourse around digital devices is the fact that it's a universal neutral solution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think like being able to put critics into that and to say that you have to contextualize, like there is no one solution fits all in health and like starting with this assumption and because if you say we are doing global health programs, we need to find solutions that are universal and by doing that if you are erasing the contextuality of the health system, I think that's the first huge mistake that, that you are doing. And the digital tools are helping a lot to do this like flattening the health uh, system mm -hmm. because there is this myth around like this neutral universal uh, technologies like uh, in STS, uh, it's been decades that people are showing that technologies are political, social, and it's, it's a more complex uh, um, assemblage uh, of stuff. So I, I would just say that if you perceive their presentation as local uh, example and uh, not uh, mm -hmm. tools that are helping to envision global proposal around digital tools, that was not at all the point. And uh, we are all working on different uh, countries in different settings to show that this is a global trend and not only specifically related to India mm -hmm. or Ghana. So, yeah. Anyone else want to speak to this? I mean, I think I, I will say just one thing really quickly, which is I, I think the regulation issue is immense and really, really sticky and hard to solve. But left to their own devices, companies like Facebook are going to default to self-regulation. And self-regulation means self-governance. It means literally setting up panels of experts to decide what you can see and what constitutes free speech. And I think that's very, very dangerous. Um, so I think the challenge is not to allow companies to self-govern and self-regulate in that. And I think that really has to be a starting point. Yeah, um, mine, I guess, is to Rajiv. It's a follow-up of she, uh, she's point, I guess, about appropriation of the body. I, I wonder, it may be a nitpicking, but I think it's conceptually useful to distinguish between appropriation of the body and appropriation of knowledge of the body. Uh, that knowledge is intimate, it, it's personal, but it, nevertheless, I think if we're going to go on discussing this, I would suggest that we distinguish between appropriation of the body and appropriation of knowledge of the body, which is especially relevant to this debate. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Unless it's related. No, it's okay. related to the body. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the difference. Uh, which I would highlight in what you're trying to point about appropriation of body and appropriation about the knowledge of body. So here I would rather say both of it in a sense because the other term which I used of uh, what I call the double geopardy and the population which I'm specifically focusing upon, the BPL population. So for me and also the whole idea of selling biometrics technologies because initially it is and again, I mean, if you go deeper in history, in colonial history, biometrics started from India in, in uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, Galton, Edward Henry. So the whole notion of bi using biometrics is based on the idea of mistrust, so where the bodies are mistrusted. And why I use the second term, double geopardy? Because the whole state's approach on planning or using technologies of identification, biometrics is majorly used, is to consider that most of the beneficiaries are ghost beneficiary, corrupt beneficiaries, they're doing some, some, some scams, so they want to identify them properly. So now here, it's just not the knowledge of the body, it is control of the body, in control in total. It is being used to 
to control access to food entitlements. That's what I have published in the past with digital state and food entitlements. And that was also highlighted because there has been starvation death in Jharkhand because somebody had no Aadhaar and couldn't access food entitlements. Now, uh, it, it's, it's kind of biggest paradox that they ask biometrics identification for a dead person's death certificate. So if someone has died, how could that person have a ID, UID if that person didn't have a UID? I mean, that's fundamentally a big question to ask. Mm -hmm. Then they are asking UID for uh, midday meal access. So in the West, uh, any kid going to the school, he doesn't have to prove himself to get the midday meal, right? But in, in, in India, they're asking Aadhaar for accessing midday meals, scholarship, social security, pension, uh, the number is endless, you know? So it's just not the knowledge of the body, it's total control of the body and total control of entire welfare entitlements which the state is providing. And this again falls back to the premise of efficiency and saving money for the exchequer, which again has to be studied in a much more deeper way. So, yeah. But in terms of theoretical uh, approach, uh, I would recommend maybe to use the Gilles Deleuze uh, individual term because then the body as a whole or the knowledge of the body or the fraction knowledge of it, in fact, is a, is a consensus around the fact that you exist only as the individual, means part of your existence that are in the database. And I think this also resonates really interestingly with the concept in many parts of Africa as well as other parts of the world that if I have a part of your body, I have power over you, right? That I have power to do witchcraft. I have power to, um, I'm thinking of when I worked in Lesotho, people thought that the government was collecting HIV tests um, in order to do large scale sort of corruption um, power gaining practices. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting twist on sort of like, how people might be perceiving the way that these biometric cards are actually being used. One last question, uh, Alicia. Um, yeah, I'm actually very sorry that I won't be here tomorrow. I'm sure this will come up, but just it, Nora's comment triggered this that, you know, we have to be aware in discussing all of this that over the last 30, 40 years, the government's capacity, the same blurring of private and public sectors and the erosion of state functions uh, has meant that state capacity to regulate has been hollowed out. The same neoliberal prescriptions that have been for privatization and trade liberalization have also just really, really crippled states in the global south in terms of regulation and at the same time the political processes have been uh, very um, distorted. So in terms of coming up with proposals and solutions that go beyond self-regulation, I think we have to have that in mind very mm. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't believe uh, in the hollowing of the state. Huh? Personally, uh, if you look at uh, digital regulation today, you take the European Union, who is making pay today? Google, Facebook, all these people, it's like state-funded agency, like the CNIL, the European CNIL. These people are civil servants. They, they are five people working on this, and they are able to make mm -hmm. Google pay $500 million. Mm -hmm. So I believe, I really believe that the state is there. It's just that someday people from the state are taking action against these big players, and other days they just look on the other side. So I think it's also very important to give uh, evidence that what these player, big players are doing is against the civil rights and is against the society. And this is happening. In, uh, I'm European, so I will defend this. Like the European Union today is the only uh, regulation mechanism that is happening against the big uh, tech players. Huh? And, I, and, uh, and I think it's too bad that the same is not happening in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll I, give I, I agree with you, yeah. and I think just as you said a moment ago, it's contextual, so yeah. there are reasons yeah, why yeah. it's yeah. So, so let's give one final word and then take the debate to yes. the coffee table. Uh, so I just want to respond to the conversation between Ali and Marheen. Um, in India, the government that has just come back into power mm -hmm. has, during the last general elections, which were held in May, made, I'm saying the government and not the political party, 
has made massive use of Facebook in order to come back into power. And Facebook and social media have been used very deliberately. Facebook put in the algorithms that ensured that people saw messaging from this particular regime. People did not see the other kind of messaging that was coming out in the social media space. Facebook has allegedly made a killing on providing this useful service to the government. So when you come back and you expect a government to do regulation of an agency to whom they actually practically owe their return to power, how is that going to happen? And that is what I mean that we have to keep questioning our assumptions of the state as a monolithic, all-powerful entity. EU may be the only bastion left standing, but when EU negotiates EU free trade agreements with states in the global south, it does not apply the standards that it applies for the protection of the rights of its own citizens. It has completely different standards, and we have to live with this, and we have to strategize given this knowledge. I think that is something we are failing to do. Yeah. Mm. Here, here. Join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>